Good afternoon. I am Julio Frank, Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, before we begin today's discussion, I would like to make a few remarks on this solemn anniversary of an attack that uh, shocked the United States and the world. It has been a decade since the multiple terrorist attacks that toppled New York's majestic Twin Towers, killing nearly 3,000 people, and that smashed the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and destroyed four passenger planes. Two of those planes originated here in Boston, carrying men, women, and children from many countries. The suffering continues for the families and friends of those who perished, and also through what we are now discovering is long-term damage to the health of first responders. Since 2001, the world has seen other sudden and horrific disasters, both natural and man-made. In the month immediately following the 9-11 attacks, we saw the potential that the utilization of biological agents in the form of anthrax opens to generate fear among populations. We recognize, of course, that there is a qualitative difference between natural disasters and epidemics on the one hand and deliberate attempts to hurt human, fellow human beings on the other. Nevertheless, there are common elements of preparedness and response irrespective of the origin of an emergency. While we in public health focus on prevention of harm, when events of any cause do occur, we concentrate on what can be done to reduce death, disease, disability, and suffering. When disaster strikes, we are here to advise governments, first responders, and those directly impacted on how to protect themselves, help others survive, survive and hasten recovery. Disaster preparedness has been of special interest to our school since even before the tragic events of 9-11. We have established senior leadership programs, education and research, all aimed at developing a more effective immediate response from those called upon to act when catastrophe hits. Our purpose at the forum here today is to take the lessons learned from 9-11 and other disasters that followed and ask what should we be doing to lessen the impact to life and health in the face of nature's constant turmoil and the evil or reckless acts of misguided individuals. I want to thank our moderator and our panelists for being here with us today. And also I want to thank Reuters for its collaborations and its fantastic promotion of this forum event on its website. And thanks to all of you, our studio audience, and our online viewer viewers for joining our discussion today and our remembrance of those who died 10 years ago. Thank you, Dean Frank. I'm Aaron Pressman from the Boston Bureau of Reuters, and I'll be moderating today's panel. We're going to use a very simple format. Each of the panelists, a diverse group of experts, will speak for about five minutes. We'll have a little bit of discussion and question and answer amongst ourselves. And then for the second half of the program, we'll turn to you in the room and to our online audience, hopefully, for your questions and your feedback on what's happened. So I'll give a brief introduction, starting here at my left with Dr. Stefanos Kales, an associate professor in environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health. He trained in internal and occupational medicine and has studied various hazardous materials events and the effect on first responders, including the US Fire Service. He's also expert in assessing health in populations after various types of exposures, and will speak today about the health consequences of the disaster in 9-11 on workers and first responders. To his left, Professor Jennifer Leanings from Harvard School of Public Health and a founder of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative is an expert on disaster assessment and response. She has studied a range of issues that have promoted good response or make for poor ones and teaches a course on disaster response here at the school. She will give us a high level assessment of some of the lessons that have been learned from a series of disasters over the last decade. Next to her, Dr. Stephanie Caden, an international emergency physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, is also a faculty member at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Dr. Caden has extensive field experience from earthquakes in Pakistan and Haiti to the most recent Japanese triple calamity of an earthquake, a tsunami, and a radiation release. She will speak today about some of her observations from the Japan disaster. 
Finally, Dr. Isaac Ashkenazi is Professor of Disaster Medicine at Ben-Gurion University in Israel and is a former Surgeon General of the Home Front Command in Israel. He is one of the world's foremost experts on disaster response and crisis leadership and is often consulted by governments in the midst of crisis. He's also Director of the Urban Terrorism Preparedness Project at Harvard School of Public Health's National Preparedness Leadership Initiative. His topic today will be U.S. leaders and perhaps complicated by the current political climate. So we'll start first with Dr. Kales. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this uh, very important event along with such a great panel of very distinguished colleagues. Uh, from the standpoint of occupational medicine and worker health, 9-11-2001, in particular the World Trade Center tragedy and disaster, is truly an unprecedented event in terms of its scope and magnitude uh, from the physical size and also the number of workers uh, affected. If we think about that day, uh, September 11th, 2001, we had a uh, very serious chain of events starting out with terrorist hijackings, quickly leading on to crashes of the planes into the World Trade Center. This was uh, quickly ensued by very large explosions, precipitating enormous fires, and eventually structural collapse of two of the largest buildings in, in Manhattan. If we think about just the firefighters alone, Dean Frank mentioned over 3,000 individuals killed that day. In terms of the fire service, the impact was, was unprecedented. We normally have uh, 100 firefighters killed in the line of duty in the entire United States country over a 12-month period. Here we had 343, over 300 firefighters killed in one spot, in one day, in one event, in one city. Along with that, major impact on the psyche of the fire service and the other public safety responders. They were all realizing their city and their country were under foreign attack. The structural collapse continued the chain of events, provoking an enormous dust cloud. Uh, now, initially, the, the impetus and the, the impulse is really for immediate survival and getting out. But what people weren't probably thinking about at that moment was this was now an acute hazardous material of event. This was a tremendous dust cloud which really was creating hazardous exposures not only on September 11, 2001, but for the 10 months going on at different intensities until that site was closed in the late spring or early summer of 2002. We had over 50,000 workers exposed in total, uh, either on that day or in that 10 months of rescue and recovery work. This included uh, over 12,000 firefighters from the FDNY, or the New York Fire Department, and many other workers in the construction trades, other public safety workers, many other trades. And at least over 30,000 of these individuals have gone undergone very assiduous medical surveillance uh, carefully for the last 10 years by a number of different groups, including the fire department itself. So emerging from that uh, large body of research, we do have a health legacy emerging from the World Trade Center disaster. And I just summarize very quickly some points from that. First and foremost, in the first year following the structural collapse of the building, there was clearly a marked decrement in the pulmonary function of the firefighters and the other rescue workers. Uh, when the firefighters had baseline uh, pulmonary function done beforehand, so they could carefully track and compare to pre-9-11 levels, and they lost an average of 12 times what a person loses over a typical year. Uh, that stabilized, however, it has not really recovered in the ensuing years. Uh, similar decrements in pulmonary function consistent with that were observed in the other rescue and recovery workers. As I mentioned, this was a tremendous uh, psychological event, and major impacts were seen in terms of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, up to a quarter of the responders initially, and that's persisted at a lower level yet today, and also accompanying increases in anxiety and depression. Fortunately, in terms of mortality, there have been no uh, documented increases in mortality. In fact, these are healthy workers, so their mortality is lower than the average population around them. And finally, with regard to cancer, there's really some very early emerging data coming out, but it, it is much too early to conclude anything about that. But that is certainly going to be one of the most controversial and problematic uh, issues in terms of the health legacy of the World Trade Center going on. Professor Leaning. 
Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, the uh, galvanization of response that came after 9-11, and we were all wa watching it. Um, some people at the school were actually there very soon afterwards as uh, first responders and health people. Um, I was one watching it, not on site. Uh, what you saw mobilized was an extraordinary response on the part of a highly resourced and developed city. It was overwhelmed, but it swung into gear. And I'd like to make three points about what we understand about disasters. We witnessed it then, uh, and we are seeing it play out in a number of disasters now in the last 10 years. One is this issue of epidemiology. Natural disasters are increasing in intensity and in number. This has been tracked. It has been substantiated. It is a consistent trend line since we first started looking and looking at the records since 1900. They're increasing. Uh, in number and intensity, number is probably due to weather-related incidents. Primarily, that is the floods and winds and um, massive movements of water. The earthquakes, much harder to estimate in terms of incidence of increase. Uh, the intensity is linked partly to the fact that these storms are much stronger than they have been. And a number of people attribute this to weather change, whether it's climate-induced or not, is another topic. But they are stronger in terms of categories and winds and impact and scope. Uh, the other reason that they are considered more intense is that there are more people being affected by these weather-related events and more people affected by earthquakes. The population has grown enormously since 1900, something on the order of five or six times. Uh, we have people now densely settled in areas that are at risk for weather-related storms and earthquakes. So when something occurs, you have more people who will be injured, more people who do have to flee, and potentially more people who will die. Another aspect of the epidemiology as we've tracked it, and much of this data comes from an excellent center in Europe at the University of Louvain called CRED, the Center for the Research in the Epidemiology of Disasters, and they've collaborated with the U.S. and FEMA in, in having an emergency disaster database. Uh, another thing we have learned, however, is that the numbers of deaths from these events, if you go back 50 years and you now look um, on an annual basis here. With a few exceptions, on an annual basis, the number of deaths have declined and in the last couple of decades stayed steady. So this is in the midst of massive population increase and growing intensity and frequency of these disasters. The emergency response community, and that includes the bureaucracy within governments, is doing a pretty good job. Otherwise, we would not see this decline in deaths. We'd see a massive increase. That's epidemiology. The second point I'd like to make is about governance. To respond to major disasters, and that in certainly includes um, man-made, maliciously man-made disasters, uh, one needs to have a highly focused government that has permission from the public and from its elected leadership to invest money in planning and preparedness. To respond to disasters is very costly. You have to do the planning. You have to get the process in shape and the systems across a diverse terrain. This country is very complicated. You need to train people at all levels. You've got to develop technological aspects of this. You've got to support the building and reconstruction of different kinds of shelters, good fire ambulance equipment, et cetera. Uh, and you have to have large and consistent ways of reaching out to a diverse population. A government that cares about its people, or because of the popular democratic aspect of the government, must care about its people or it will be elected out of office. A government that cares about its people will invest in disaster preparedness. Now that's true of wealthy countries. Poor countries do not have the marginal resources to devote to disaster preparedness. And so in poor countries, a given harsh event is likely to have a greater population impact because the country's not been able to pay for adequate warning or evacuation. There are a few countries that are major exceptions to this. Bangladesh is our poster child for a poor country proving excellent at disaster preparedness. What are, what's in the toolkit for a government when you were dealing with earthquakes, 
it's, it's hardening of construction. That requires architecture, design, and regulatory consistency and coherence, and making sure that at ground level in every town and city that these regulations are complied with. If the buildings are structurally sound, there is a very good likelihood that large numbers of people will survive even a very powerful earthquake. We've seen aberrations in many situations over this decade, and you can see the reverberations of not paying attention to these issues. The Sichuan earthquake was a very major one in 2005. The other aspect is what you do with these major wind and water-related storms. This is warning and evacuation. And since these are the preponderance of natural disasters striking this world, it is helpful to note that these are in large measure predictable. Wind and water storms do not come out of the blue. They have a seasonal periodicity. You can see them coming. We have much better technologies than we had, say, with a Galveston earthquake or, uh, hurricane in 1900. Uh, we can track them. I look at the close, meticulous attention to Hurricane Irene we had. So in the face of adequate warning, you need then to have plans for evacuation. And there are many lessons learned over this last decade where we um, have failed and we've tried improvements, we failed again, and there's more to learn. And we could talk about that later if that's of interest. But warning and evacuation are the methods. The last point I'd like to make is about response and psychology. A good government needs to let its people know, even in the developed world, that we can't get there in the first 24 or 36, let's try 72 hours. When that impact hits, everybody is out of the streets, underground, or somewhere safe. It's when the impact has faded, then you want to see the response community come into full force. And if that response community does not come into full force as you come out and you know, finish your last water bottle, that's when people begin to have criticism and they blame the government. That's why the impact of disasters reverberates through the political system. And it's also an important point to realize that the longest lived aspect of a disaster, what lingers in memory decades later for any disaster affected community, is did the outside world come in to help? So for mental health reasons and for the initial salvage of life and the mitigation of suffering throughout the life cycle of a disaster, it is essential that we put in the resources to take care of people, including our most vulnerable, and be in a position to respond quickly because we don't have a lot of time before people run out of patience. Thank you. Dr. Caden. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Um, from the perspective of the recent triple calamity in Japan, where we had an earthquake followed by a tsunami and then a radiologic disaster, um, there are a couple of lessons that we can draw from that. Drawing to from Len, uh, Jennifer's point about a government and society preparing uh, its citizens for a disaster, I think it's fairly safe to say that Japan is probably one of the best prepared societies in the world. Um, they have correctly done a disaster risk assessment that tells them that their country is, in fact, um, going to suffer earthquakes, and they have been preparing for this for many years. Every uh, Japanese young person from kindergarten through their school years goes through training on exactly what to do in the case of an earthquake. Um, and everyone in the community knows uh, what to do as far as going to shelters and that kind of thing. These uh, preparedness measures are extremely important. Along the lines of preparedness for the earthquakes in Japan, you also have to think about the building codes. Um, building codes are extremely strict and they have earthquakes on a fairly regular basis. Um, and yet the, the damage to actual buildings, um, structural collapse, is extremely rare. And this is all, of course, um, chalked up to uh, the society preparing itself for disasters. So when the disaster of March 11 struck, um, it struck uh, in a country that was highly vulnerable, but also highly prepared. Uh, for what was coming. That's why uh, we saw very little structural damage uh, from the earthquake, um, very few deaths in Japan from the earthquake itself. Of course, what followed was the thing that was the main problem, which was the tsunami. 
the tsunami that followed the earthquake was also uh, an eventuality that Japan had prepared for. Uh, people had evacuation routes. Local schools uh, knew exactly where they were to take children if they were in a low-lying area. And all of this was put into to play. Uh, there was an advanced early warning system so that uh, much of the population along the coastlines who were affected by the tsunami actually had about an hour's notice before the tsunami arrived. That gave people uh, time to largely evacuate the coastal areas. Uh, and there was good success with that. <coughs> However, of course, that was uh, not a perfect system for many reasons. Um, a few of the reasons included that some people evacuated as they were told to and went to higher ground. And then within that first hour, as they were waiting, decided to go back to their homes and collect some personal items or some important things there and were then caught in the tsunami as it arrived. The other thing uh, that, that people faced was that in many of the communities, large walls were built to try to keep out the impact of the tsunamis. And there were a few people who uh, depended a little more on these walls than they should have because the tsunami was of epic proportions. Uh, it was much higher in many places than these walls were built, and they were built uh, based on data that went back hundreds, a uh, hundred years, uh, as far as what the highest tsunami had ever been in that area. And and even with these walls in place, the tsunami went right over the top in many cases, and people were caught unaware. So. The inability to completely prepare for any disaster is always going to be present. But I think it is worth notice, noting that even though Japan suffered a tremendous number of casualties because of the tsunami, um, many, many people were actually spared because they knew where to go uh, and, and what to do. If you look at all of the fatalities in this recent triple disaster in Japan, um, about 92% of the people who died uh, died of drowning. It was from the tsunami. Very, very few people died in the earthquake um, and other related causes, which uh, is, says a lot about Japan's ability to, uh, to prepare. Not everything um, that you have on the books in your preparation plans uh, go very well, though. Uh, Japan also had plans in place vis-a-vis um, -vis its nuclear reactors to prepare for earthquakes and for tsunamis. Um, the nuclear reactors are on automatic shutdown in the case of an earthquake, and they did shut down as planned um, when, they, when they sensed the earthquake. However, in the case of the uh, Daiichi plant in Fukushima, it was actually the tsunami that caused the major uh, disaster there. Um, after the plant shut down, power was lost to, to the backup cooling systems, and then when the tsunami wave came, it also was higher than the barriers that were built, and uh, the tsunami went into the, uh, the, uh, nuke, uh, the Daiichi reactor and um, shut down more of the cooling systems. And that sent the Daiichi plant into the spiral that led to the radiation scare. I think the main lesson to draw from this nuclear uh, radiation disaster was one m not so much of preparing the plants, but much more of uh, preparing the community and the local leaders um, for the communication of radiation risk that was found after that uh, disaster, and um, the preparedness and response to the radiation type disaster. In the community in Fukushima, right around the plant, there was a lot of uh, concern among the local population that they were receiving different information from different sources. There were evacuation lines drawn, a uh, 20 km kilometer radius um, in the beginning, and people were evacuated, and yet the radiation readings were inconsistent. It also didn't help that uh, there happens to be many different ways of measuring radiation. The units come in rads, in microsieverts, in millisieverts, and numbers were being put out in the early days that were in all of these different units. And so even the local people on the ground, the local doctors who uh, know about these radiation units were having difficulty trying to figure out how much radiation actually was present. 
in the end, looking back, it turned out that there was actually very little radiation present and uh, the people around the plant in the local community were exposed to very little radiation, something along the, the lines of an x-ray mm -hmm. um, and, and not more than a CAT scan. That was a safe level and yet the information that the people needed to know to be reassured was not forthcoming, it was not clear um, and the communication was a bit of a problem uh, in that part of the disaster. So I think there's a lesson there for, for all of us. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to look at this particular disaster because it's both uh, a very good example of excellent preparedness, excellent planning, drilling on the, on the part of the population, planning for the vulnerable communities, but also we see uh, that there were um, holes, as there are in any plan, that we can, we can learn from. On a final note, I would say to wrap up that one of the things that we saw in Japan um, was that the public health planning in the shelters um, was one of the parts where there were the biggest challenges. There were about 30 percent of the people in the shelters were over the age of 65. It was a large elderly population with thoughts of chronic medical conditions. And uh, the people, when they got to the shelters, did not have access to their daily medications. And there were a lot of uh, complications uh, from people with uncontrolled diabetes and high blood pressure. The other thing that uh, was a little bit of a challenge for the shelter planning was that um, this happened in wintertime, and it was very cold out and many of the shelters lacked both the fuel and the heating resources to keep the population warm in the shelters and so there were a lot of problems uh, with the extreme cold. So I think there are lots of things we can learn from this. I think the public health, uh, public health preparedness for the, for the disaster as well as the communication around the radiation would be the two biggest ones. Thank you, Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Dr. Ashkenazi. I will talk about um, leadership lessons and I decided to choose three lessons that are very important and they are connected to each other. The first lesson is the public, the people, the individuals, the residents. The second lesson is resilience. The third lesson is mistakes and I will talk about mistakes and I will connect my, my lesson to uh, Jennifer Lenning's um, um, uh, words about uh, mistakes. So, the first one is the public. This is a superpower. This country is a superpower. This country is not a superpower because a super military. This is not superpower because uh, your uh, infrastructures, because of your beautiful geography that I admire. This is a superpower because of your people. Because of the people of the United States, this is a superpower. This country was established and was developed bottom up by resilient individuals. And they built a superpower a model for the Western world. Ten years ago, a devastating terror attack struck the art of New York, the art of the United States, the, the heart of the world. And then the governments, not only in the United States, but especially in the United States, they decided no more. The government of the United States decided that they will be better. They will improve their prevention. They will improve their preparedness for disasters, not only terror attacks. So they allocated many resources. They invested so much time, and I'm telling you, at the last decade, United States, the government, the federal level, the emergency organizations are well prepared. Ten years, you are well prepared. And we have very, very uh, few examples from the past, but the last two can, can show you how prepared is the federal level. But, but something happened during the last ten years, unintentionally. 
by enforcing and empowering the federal level, the emergency systems, all the responsibility of the individuals was taken up, was absorbed bottom up. So actually, the government is staying there, and every disaster that strike United States, that strike the people, the government is promising that next, next time they will do it better. Next time that the preparedness would be better. But it is impossible to do better without the individuals. They are not casualties. They are not victims. They are bystanders. And let me tell you a few words about my experience at the last, last 30 years. The real first responders are not the official with uniform first responders. The real first responders are the bystanders those that are in the event. They are saving lives. Look at Haiti. 211 trapped victims have been saved by all the search and rescue forces from all over the world. And thousands have been saved by themselves and by bystanders. So the implication of that is government should use the public as an asset, not as an obstacle. The public should be the first to prevent. They can prevent terrors. They can prevent disasters. They can contain disasters. disasters. But we should give them tools. We should give them education. We should share with them. We should share with them information. We must share with them responsibility. We must share with them responsibility for preparedness, responsibility for response, responsibility for consequences, and also meeting expectations. This is a shared responsibility, disasters. So people are not victims. People are active bystanders, and we should acknowledge that, that. This is first. Second is resilience. This is a buzzword in United States resilience lately. Why we are using resilience lately? Why? Because if you are smart, you don't have to define what smart is it. I, it is. You don't have to, de to define smart or smartness. But when you are not smart, you have to define it. <laughs> so when you are not resilient, you have to define resilience. So lately, we are struggling to define resilience. But it is not about definition. It is about the content. It is about the process. It is about the outcome. This is like walking up in a reverse escalator. Once you stand, the reverse escalator will take you down. Resiliency, this is something, a process that should, you should continue to empower it all the time. Resilience is not only top down. Resilience of infrastructures, resilience of government, resilience of, of emergency systems. Resilience, in my opinion, starts also bottom up from the public. So implication, the government, the leaders should empower the resiliency of their people. And there are many ways how to do it. And I don't have time to talk about it. Third lesson, mistakes. I'm watching to your eyes, leaders. This is OK to make mistakes. <laughs> United States, so, stop being so perfectionist. You can't be perfectionist in crisis. It is impossible. Impossible to be perfectionist in crisis. Impossible. So by trying to be perfectionist, you are denying mistakes. And you are actually covering mistakes. And you don't know how to deal with mistakes. I'm telling you, I made so many mistakes. <laughs> and this is the best tool to empower your crisis leadership. When you share your mistakes, this is the best tool to teach others. And we, when you don't share mistakes, so a blaming culture start to intervene. And it is like a contagious disease. And this blaming culture goes up and goes down and vertically and horizontally, contagious disease, and the blaming will continue. And then you are so distracted, and your energies are directed to blaming, and that's it. You are not 
busy with improving the systems. Implication. Leaders, this is okay to make mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. Four very thought-provoking and very different pieces. I have a few follow-up <laughs> questions, but I want you out there and also online to please be thinking of your own questions in the areas that you'd like to hear more about. But I'll start with Dr. Kales. You know, we just saw a headline about one of the first studies of cancer occurrences in first responders. But I know there are a lot of challenges in studying those sorts of issues in a population that's not typical. How did you view that first study and what do you think the challenges are going forward? That's a great question. <clears throat> there was a very important study you mentioned just released uh, within an issue dedicated to 9-11 uh, uh, in the Lancet. And it comes out of the New York Fire Department. And it suggests uh, with seven years of follow-up after 9-11, a very small increase in uh, all types of cancers. Uh, <clears throat> if you dissect it, the entire study, uh, piece by piece, there really is not much evidence for an increase in uh, very many individual cancers. And the increase that's seen in all cancers once it's corrected for what's known as surveillance bias is really no longer statistically significant. Mm. Now. That is not to say I don't want to, it's certainly a very well done study, uh, was a tremendous challenge and, and I really congratulate the authors for the work they undertook. Um, and it's very provocative and it's going to stimulate more work. But this is a very important topic. But it, it, it is inherently difficult, for example, with, with cancer and diseases like cancer, they, they typically have a long latency, which is what we call is basically an incubation period. So after exposures to toxic substances, we typically do not see increases in the incidence of cancers for some at least 10, if not 15, 20, and 30 years after the exposure. So it's very hard to make any firm conclusions after seven years, but certainly this is something that's going to have to go forward uh, and be followed up by more studies. However, it doesn't give an answer to the fire service, the police, the other responders who may need some answers in terms of compensation and other things. And uh, it, it's much more complicated than that even with this particular case because there are studies out there done for many years that do suggest incidence, uh, increased incidence of certain types of cancer in the fire service in general, even, even, even leaving out the World Trade Center. So, uh, but in general, there are a number of difficulties uh, in addition to that, uh, regarding latency, there's the healthy worker effect. So we have populations like the military, the police, fire, who go through very careful medical and physical ability selection criteria to enter those forces. So they are generally much more healthy than the general population surrounding them. And it's very tough to pick the appropriate comparison or control population to compare them to. Uh, with studies following events such as uh, a terrorist event or any type of workplace disaster, we have things called a recall or attribution bias. So if I ask you in the absence of any event or stressor or the possibility of any compensation, mm -hmm. if you've had a cough or you've had shortness of breath lately, your answer may be no because you don't remember the cough you had last week. But if I'm asking you right after uh, a dust cloud, and there's a possibility you could be compensated uh, because you now have a cough, you, even subconsciously your answer could change. So these, these are all things that have to be t carefully taken into consideration. And um, finally, there's the lack of, of, often there's a lack of baseline data in exposed workers. So uh, we have a group working at a site, there's a disaster, and we don't really have characterized that population's health beforehand and we're taking measurements, but we don't have something to compare it to. Fortunately, in the case of the New York Fire Department, they were undergoing regular medical evaluations since 1996, every 18 months. So they are really uh, probably a key population in this particular uh, puzzle because they have very <coughs> assiduously kept and carefully kept and thorough records going back to 1996, five years before this disaster. So uh, their outcomes in the future will be probably important in helping us dissect the puzzle for the other groups as well. So I'm sure there will be a lot more studies coming out. Absolutely. Professor Leaning, I wanted to pick up on something maybe that you touched on and Dr. Ashkenazi 
Um, you know, there was a, in one of the tornadoes in Missouri, when FEMA got there in the spring, they discovered that some of the local groups and church groups had already set up shelters. And you were mentioning, you know, uh, people as the first responders. I'm wondering, what would you say to policymakers? What do they need to do or not do? What do they need to, uh, lessons learned there in terms of the people on the ground? It's, uh, it's an interesting issue in, in disasters because we have and still do focus on public leadership. That is the identified person who's the spokesperson for the major um, government and full service response. Uh, the, Rudolph Giuliani is the poster child for that, the public leadership. Uh, he did an excellent job. I mean, there are many parameters of excellence, which include honesty and transparency and um, co compassion that you can feel that is then expressed, um, competence, willing to share the praise whenever he was asked something that he didn't know. He had his fire people and his police people and he even had his mortuary forensic guy there and he'd say he turned to them. So mm -hmm. he didn't try to capture the stage. You always had a group of people and yet he was the voice for New York City for a long time. And do you remember early on uh, when he was asked by someone in the press corps, uh, Mr. Mayor, how many people have died? And he said, I don't know, but the number will be more than we can bear. I mean, that is an incredible response. So there is a need to find these people, raise them, honor them, train them, so we have leaders who can be the voice of these massive concerns and help people put things in perspective and feel that their pain is being heard. On the other hand, we have, and that's one of the reasons why all of the teaching in the airline industry is do not put some operations manager from Logan there when there's been a massive air disaster. You need the head of the company, the head of Logan, and the mayor of the city, but, because people are expecting that. Um, on the other hand, this point about uh, what local people have to do requires, again, a recognition that people will save themselves. All search and rescue for earthquakes and and Isaac knows this very, very well, as do you, that, that, that you can send in the outside people, but the vast majority of people that are pulled from the rubble are done so in the first few hours and 24 hours, and it's the local people. Um, and, and in fact, you call them bystanders in a way they are, but they're, they're not bystanders. They actually take action and they're right there, you know, with their hands pulling people out, endangering themselves. So part of what needs to be uh, transmitted to populations now and particularly in the developed world where we kind of assume that the government will take care of us, you know, that if this is a very cur very dangerous um, entry ramp to uh, some big motorway, that there will be some sign that says caution and another sign that says yield, et cetera. We, we're used to that. Uh, this is the developed world. So we're going to have to get people to realize that when disasters start hitting us, actually you're back on your own. And here's what the transparent information is, here's really how fast we can get to you, and here's what you need to do in the interim. Now, FEMA has done that in California for earthquakes for decades, and that is a pretty well-prepared population. Um, but other parts of the world that are more prone, and including the United States, prone to um, wind and flood and tornadoes, kinds of storms, these, um, I think, create great opportunities for us to give people, local people, more energy, more information, uh, more access to sort of the basic tools they need. Um, when did you last have an announcement from the emergency radio broadcasting system? Um, I have one of those little NOAA ba backup battery electricity radios that you turn on. Uh, mm -hmm. And the batteries keep running out because it's so battery intensive. What technologies are there for people so that they can stay tuned when the electricity goes off? There's so mm -hmm. many things we should be thinking about in terms of reaching our very, very diverse population now that uh, allows them to take care of themselves. Right, if hurricanes are gonna go up into Vermont now, I guess people are gonna have to learn a lot of new skills. Um, Dr. Caden, you were talking about Japan and one aspect of the Japanese crisis that maybe was less uh, planned in advance was the mass displacement and the thousands and millions of people who had to move. That's not something that in the developed world we think about happening very much. It's more something that happens maybe we think of in Africa. What are the lessons for the policymakers here on mass displacement? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. If you think about the mass displacement emergencies that we know of, many of them are in the developing world. Uh, if you think of Darfur in Africa or the situation in the Congo 
uh, where people uh, have been faced with something that's driven them from their homes. The major international aid organizations are actually expert in dealing with those kinds of mass displacement emergencies and there's been many years of experience um, and even research into how to care for people in those times. I think when you look at the disasters in the developed world, that's uh, less common. And uh, because it's less common, because our disasters in the developed world tend not to displace such large populations of people, we haven't been as good in planning for them. If you think back to Hurricane Katrina in the United States, uh, in the U.S. Gulf Coast, which uh, is where I'm from, um, there's uh, a lot of planning for localized uh, hurricanes, um, but when Katrina came, what you saw was all of a sudden a massive displacement of a very large population, and quite frankly, our uh, disaster preparedness was not quite up to the job in that case. And if you then turn toward this most recent disaster in Japan, you see something of a similar thing. A large population that suddenly had to move away from their homes and now have to be sheltered and provided all of the services that we think of in large-scale public health emergencies. Water, food, medical care, shelter. Uh, these things, I think, are situations that we're going to have to think more about in the coming years as we uh, expect more uh, disasters that may cause large population displacements. As Jennifer was saying, these disasters are becoming uh, more and more common. I think in the developed world we'll have to see, uh, we'll begin to see more and more of these mass displacement uh, disasters. And I think that probably in the future we'll need to have much more planning um, in our domestic preparedness response toward these mass displacements. Thanks. I want to leave some time for audience questions, but do, uh, Dr. Ashkenazi, do you want to comment at all on the first responder issue and uh, who, who the people are in the ground and what they should be, how they should you be know, trained? You know, just one comment before yeah, sure. uh, moving the questions to the audience, uh, that if I'm making any mistake here, you can blame my mentor, <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Lenning, because she is my teacher in disaster management, <laughs> management in the last if, the 11 years. So. All right, well. That, that was not planted. You have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll turn first to our audience in the room. Um, Barry, do you want to ask a question? I'm Barry Dorn from the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative. And in all of your talks, the question of leadership was implicit in different ways, shapes, and forms. Uh, and Jennifer, you made the point that good government needs to let people know that for the first 72 hours, we're on our own, folks. Given the uh, litigious and um, um, politicized environment in which we live in this country, are there ways that we can do this better? Are there ways that we can help the government, help the people to take them to where Isaac wants them, to make them better responders and make them the first responders? Uh, well, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, believe that FEMA has it right now in terms of the scale of its intervention and the scope of its planning. It sees the big picture it trains the top leaders. It provides a lot of information and infrastructure for the uh, constituencies and the leadership below it. If you look at Hurricane um, Irene, uh, it was the mayors and the governors of all of these states that actually were the ones that were the deciders about who was, when evacuation was going to happen, what sort of supports there would be, what shelters to open, et cetera. They were working, obviously, with the Red Cross and other response agencies. Uh, Disaster response it requires the structures and resources and permission of high-level government, but it actually is a very local and sometimes even intimate activity. And so the more, and this I think in our politicized environment, this could be shared and agreed to by everyone. The more you can empower uh, the local levels of government, empower them not just say you're on your own, honey, but also <laughs> give them the capacity to be powerful and to think for proactively and have the equipment, et cetera. The more you can empower the local government, uh, which then in turn, if it's wise, and this could be coaching from the top, empowers every individual, as Isaac was saying, then you really get a response that has some bounce to it. I mean, the evacuation of New York City, um, I think was actually quite remarkable. I mean, over 400,000 people from the lower Manhattan lip at risk, to get them out within 24 or 36 hours, uh, not much muss or fuss. This was actually high level, 
you know, National Hurricane Center and U.S. government disaster uh, response called and disaster uh, settings um, established in terms of fund flow. But it was the mayor's decision with all of his compatriots, and then every everybody knew what to do. And, and so this, I mean, we say New York is a special place, uh, but I would love it if that kind of response, that sort of timbre of do it and bounce back, yeah, we're doing it, if we could, if we could have that be across the country. That would be excellent. Uh, sure, right here. Hi, uh, Bob Lendon, uh, professor of School of Public Health. Uh, for those of us who've been watching the 9-11 reruns uh, for uh, Isaac and Jennifer, there were three publics. There were people caught in the building. There were about a half a million people who lived around the towers or worked there. There were 10 million people in New Jersey and New York terrified out of their minds, thinking that they were at risk. We've got 10 years going back. Could we give some advice for communicating for either people in the building, the 500,000 around, or the 10 million terrified? Is there something we know now that we'd have done differently for both of you? Yes. My recommendation is uh, don't develop temples and monuments for terrorism. So once terrorism is striking, don't leave the area damaged for 10 years. I personally, I will tell you something. I was there four days after the event. I was many times in New York at the last decade. And I never, never thought about going there back. Last Wednesday, early in the morning, I went there. And it was sad. It was sad. It is a monument. It is not a monument for resilience. We need monuments of resilience in the United States, not monument to encourage the resiliency of the terrorists. I'm reading the terrorist websites, and they are encouraged by these pictures, this uh, uh, destruction. They love it in Israel. Part of the resiliency is clean the area in two days, rebuild the area in four days. Okay, it is like makeup from the outside, but you can walk in the street and you can feel relaxed, like a feeling of being resilient. You can continue your life. This is important. I am struck uh, in terms of the 500,000 and the 10 million that um, what appalled everyone at the time, and then I think continues to <coughs> upset everyone who's aware of this, is that the communication between the fire and the police didn't work. And that might have had implications for the death rate of the firemen. Uh, it was known well before, it's known actually throughout the United States that firemen and police services don't talk to each other very well. It takes concerted effort. But in this circumstance, it requires a common radio band and we still don't have a spectrum. And this came out in the 9-11 report. I, I was so, I thought it was very brave of them to say it. I mean, it's a brave commission, but this is really an important aspect that as a society, we have not been able to figure out how to have a national emergency radio band that can then be accessed for the various fire and police when they need to talk with each other. To me, it's something that um, is a challenge that lies ahead, a lesson that was learned before and relearned drastically in 9-11. And I think for these publics who uh, were privy to the anguish communications via cell phone from all these individuals, to realize that we had the technology for that, but not the technology to have a fireman and a policeman, even in one to tower, talk to each other, to me was a debacle then and remains um, a matter of high concern now. Just with one point. Communication is not about technology. This is a very po good point because, again, I'm spending a, a lot of time in the United States, and I see that every time that there is a problem, you invest money. You can't solve the communication problems by, by spending money on technology or information sharing. Technology, it can't solve the problem. You need, you need to connect to each other to speak the same disaster language. Yes, you are speaking the same American language,
But this is not a disaster language. This is not the same language. You should shake hands during preparedness, during drills. It is so important. It is not about investing money. Hmm. Very sober. I think we have some questions from online. Robin, do you? Yes, hi. I'm Robin Herman. I'm director of the forum. And we have as a feature of the forum that we can take questions from our online audience. And we've received a couple that have to do with um, handling people and helping people who are disabled at the time of an emergency. Uh, we have a question from Peg Bletchman at uh, the Federal Access Board, which is dedicated to accessible architecture. And she asks, what is the status of emergency preparedness and inclusion of people with disabilities since 9-11? There have been complaints about shelters used during Hurricane Irene being inaccessible for people with disabilities. We also have a question from Chip Wilson, a statewide disability coordinator in Florida, who asks what has been done to ensure the personal care attendants, those who take care of the disabled, are also allowed into a zone where there may be some, uh, some emergency. And I know that Professor Blendon has done some studies, um, uh, particularly around Katrina of uh, what keeps people from evacuating and often has something to do with the fact that they can't get their disabled relatives and friends out of the area. Do you want to take that? Sure. I can take that. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely key point and something that's been overlooked in disaster planning for far too long. There are, in fact, in a lot of disaster plans these days, um, provisions for the disabled, but they're totally lacking and not enough to supply the need that we uh, have now and will have, I think, in, in increasing numbers in the future um, for the, the planning for the disabled, both in the evacuation, which is um, a very large concern, and, uh, and in the sheltering. Uh, if you look at the planning for uh, the mass, dis mass displacement emergencies internationally, there is more and more planning actually that goes into um, areas like refugee camps and making toilets so that the disabled can use them and, and that kind of thing. Um, but if you look into the domestic disaster scenario, it's um, almost a more complicated problem because in the United States we have people who not only use wheelchairs but who have other significant medical needs that make them very vulnerable. People who are on dialysis, people who are uh, immunosuppressed because they're getting complicated cancer treatments. Um, even in the, uh, the recent Japan disaster, one of the hospitals there um, has, uh, the hospitals tend to have a protocol that if there is a disaster, the elevators are shut down and um, the elevators in the hospital can't be used until an official from, uh, who's trained in elevator technician repair comes and certifies the elevator and then they can restart them. Well, if you have uh, a hospital that is full of uh, disabled people and people who have trouble moving, if you can't move them up and down, um, you, you have a big problem. So I think thinking about this is, I think it's increasing, I think it's improving, but it's not nearly where we need to be. Well, we just, uh, we just got something, just, just came in, just as you were talking, um, from Brian uh, Geiger, um, who is a uh, assistant director for the Center for Educational Accountability at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And he says, this week we will launch a voluntary disability registry permitting metro area residents to receive first alerts about public emergencies and post-disaster resources for assistance. And he says they're reassuring all users that the information is private and secure and so forth. And so he was asking about what cautions do you suggest when implementing a voluntary disability registry? Of course, there are privacy issues, but that may be getting into too fine detail for this discussion. There, there are a lot of things to consider with um, privacy, obviously. But uh, such a system would allow us to reach out to people quickly if, again, we can figure out the communication issues. The bigger thing is what do you do with the planning? Um, I think if we need to look at uh, a group that has done m more planning around this perhaps than most, um, the people who serve people who have kidney disease who are on hemodialysis, um, who are dependent on having their hemodialysis three times a week where they become extremely ill, um, they actually have a remarkable set of disaster plans in place for that population of patients. And when disasters strike, they as a group will get together and organize for people to be transferred out to different places so that they can be in a place that has ready access to dialysis facilities. Um, and I think that could probably serve as a model for how you get that done. Do we have time for one, in, one more in the right here? 
Dr. Miriam Ashkenazi, no relations, um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. It seems to me that we see a lot of um, urbanization in the developing world, and so now we are seeing more urban disasters in the developing nation, in the developing world, and how does that intersect with the urban disasters we see in the developed world, and what are, if there are lessons learned for us to cross-pollinate as we are now really starting to deal with urban disaster as a big issue. And I guess that's for the entire panel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I have one remark. I, I know that Isaac is working on urban issues um, and crises, so I will defer to him. But one, one point is that these, uh, these cities in the developing world are enormous. We're talking about millions and millions without infrastructure built to support them. No roads, no sanitation, no communication systems. So they are almost like the um, 100,000 or so who were trapped in Hurricane Katrina who had no way out. The people that were trapped in Hurricane Katrina were vulnerable because they were vulnerable, disabled, without transport, never been outside the city, et cetera. Um, the people in these large um, developing urban slums are vulnerable because they are in a place they can't get out of. So any of the issues that arise with mass disasters that require a va warning, you can't reach them, or evacuation, um, mean that the death rate will be very, very high. Um, and the other aspect is that in these areas, the possibility for hazardous materials disasters, because they're close to industrial areas. Bhopal is, again, an example of large numbers not protected near an industrial plant with a toxic plume emission. Talk about not having baselines to establish what happened to that population. Um, so this is what I think we're facing. Uh, it's a very, very high bar of concern, and it's, it's going to require layers and layers of good governance investment and, and local resilience. Uh, money and attention that the governments of these societies often don't have. Well, maybe I have one comment, and I will try to be politically correct. <laughs> Not what I <laughs> Developed <laughs> countries, uh, you have the attention of the media. If 10 guys will be killed there, you know, everyone will talk about it. But there are places in developing countries that hundreds are killed every day and nobody is talking about it. It is not in the attention. You know, I was in one of your disasters actually in, in the Nairobi terror attack. At the same time, there was a huge flood in China. I was, I was back to Israel and my students collected all the information about this, the disasters in, in, in all the, over the world. So the attention was on Nairobi. No attention about so many thousands that have been killed uh, in, in China. Um, the leadership skills, uh, the, the two places are the same, but the challenges are totally different. The challenges are different, and we can talk about it three weeks. I think that's just about all the time we have for today's forum. But again, I want to thank our panelists for diverse opinions on this very interesting topic. And thank you all for coming.